want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians or flip through your phones or flip across your tablet or whatever you're using these days. Uh, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 6. All right, well, I invite you to stand with me out of respect to God and His Word. Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 1. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Slaves, and uh, in our context, we could probably say employees and employers. So I'm going to insert employees and employers, even though some of you may relate to the slaves part. Won't go into that. Employees, obey your earthly employers with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. As em- As slaves of Christ, or as those who work for Christ, do the will of God with all of your heart. Work with enthusiasm, as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are employees or free. Masters or employers, treat your employees in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven as he has no favorites. This is God's word. You may be seated. Just a a quick poll. Have you ever like sang a song? Maybe you're in the shower, you're driving along, you're singing the song to some, um, to music, and you realize that it's not the right words. Can you fill in this phrase? If you don't know the song, don't, if you don't know the words, don't, don't sing the song. Well, I've been known to do that, and I was just thinking about that a little bit as we get rolling into here. Uh, there was a, there's a Christian comedian. His name is Tim Hawkins, and uh, he tells a story about his brother singing a song by the group America. It's kind of a hippie song from the 70s, and the song goes like this. I've been in the desert on a horse with no name. Well, his brother sang it, I've been to the desert on a horse with no brain. (laughs) And then that got me thinking because I did the same thing. Um, Back in the 80s, there was a a song called The Eye of the Tigers from one of the Rocky movies. It was by a group called Survivor. In fact, uh, there was a a, a variety act in the variety show just a little while ago where they, they used that song. And they helped me out because I learned the words that night. <laughs> I thought it was, it's the eye of the tiger, it's the cream of the fight. <laughs> and I've sung it for years, not thinking, what does cream and fighting and boxing have to do with one another? It's just one of those, one of those things. And then as I was telling Tammy about this, she had a song, there's a song by John Cougar Mellencamp, And it goes something like this. When I fight authority, authority always wins. And Tammy thought the song went, when I fight with Dorothy, (laughs) Dorothy always wins. (laughs) And so I told her, no, it's authority. And she goes, oh. But I thought it was cream. So it's just kind of ways, if we had some time, I bet you you could tell a story, too, of a song that you sang at the top of your lungs that you thought, yeah, these are the right words, and they weren't. Well, today I want to talk about authority. And when you talk about authority, um, authority gets a bad rap, doesn't it? Because usually when people think of authority negatively, it's because there's a story. Or they've witnessed or seen something where authority was misused or authority was abused. But that doesn't have to be the case. And as we saw from this passage of Scripture, we're going to look in two different contexts, in the family and in the work. And when there is healthy authority, and when there's healthy obedience, and there's healthy leadership, 
God actually causes harmony and he creates a blessing. And the same for the work environment. And so I'm going to talk to children today. I'm going to talk to students. I'm going to talk to those of you who are employees and you have bosses and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to also talk to you if you're a leader, if you're a parent, if you're a boss, if you're a manager, if people report to you in some way like you're in a, or, a volunteer organization or, or something like that. And I want to talk about how God blesses environments where people understand authority, either on the following it and seeking to please those in authority or those who are in authority and seeking to try to uh, manage and, and lead an organization. When you look at the Bible, God has established three institutions on this planet that involve structure and authority from the Bible. First of all, it's the family. That's the first institution. Secondly, the government, government authorities. And then finally, the church. And so when Paul was speaking, for example, about government and authority, he said something in his teaching that was a general principle about authority. It's found in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. You don't have to uh, look it up. I can just read it to you. And I might have a slide for it. Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. And then this line is at the top of your notes on the back of the program. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against God, and they will be punished. Now that's speaking about government and authority and laws and that sort of thing when it comes to the punishment side. But what the Bible says, what God teaches us, is that God has established human authority. It's part of his purpose. It's part of his plans and how that all unfolds. And your first fill-in, it says God works through human authority. What I mean by that is that he will guide your life and his plans will unfold as you work with or you are a part of human authority structures. Now, when you put human and you put authority together, that's kind of dangerous, isn't it? Because when I think of human, I think of the phrase, hey, I'm only what? Human. That means I'm imperfect. And so when, when God says, I have placed and established human authority, by its very nature, it's going to be imperfect. Would you agree with me on that? Anybody agree that there are some authorities in our lives that aren't quite perfect? <laughs> yeah, that's true. And so if you're, um, if you're in that kind of a situation, though it's imperfect, God says he is greater than any human authority, and he still works through it. Just start reading stories in the Bible of bad human authority and how there are servants of God within that bad authority and how God's plans still unfolded. And so even though there's bad authority, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute here, uh, authority has been placed there by God. And if you are in authority, I, I want to tell you something you may not realize. God has placed you in authority over people. And the reason why he has placed you in authority is that he wants you to be his agent of good and blessing in the lives of other people. And so that's something to think about. There's a big picture view besides you just being a manager at work, for example. Or, but it's more clear as a parent. And so God oversees all of this. And he is, he is the ultimate authority when it comes to authority. And so for all this to make sense, we have to come to a place where we realize, okay, God is the ultimate authority and he has established human authority here on this earth. Why? Because when it's running well and, when, and people understand why and how it's supposed to work, it creates harmony and not chaos where everyone's doing right in their own eyes. If you want to read that, you can read the book of Judges in the Old Testament. And so God has established this human authority. So I'm just, I'm just going to do two things this morning. I'll talk about uh, how, or how can I learn to be a good follower, and then I'm going to talk about how I can learn to be a good leader, and then I want to talk about how the Lord Jesus Christ fits in all of this. So in verses 1 through 3, Paul speaks to the children first. So kids, this is something for you. Now, in Paul's day... This was a letter that was read to gatherings of, of Christians in the city of Ephesus. 
And so the kids were listening to this letter, just like the kids here today in the service are listening to what we're saying right now. So they sat there and listened to this letter being read to them aloud. So this was their part of the letter where their ears probably perked up a little bit. Uh, in Paul's day, he, kids were there. And so he says that every, uh, every child, every kid needs to obey their parent. He starts with the kids first because every great parent, every great boss, every great leader started off as a kid. And what they learned as a kid carried with them to be a great leader. I mean, more times than not, that's the case. And when you see great leaders, you probably see a great kid growing up as well. And so kids are told they need to obey their parents or their guardians or whoever is in charge of them. And he says that you need to not only obey and do what they say, but you need to do it with a respectful attitude. So what this means is that if you are going to obey your parents or obey someone who's in charge of you, you need to do it quickly and you need to do it cheerfully. That's how you know you're obeying God in doing that. Your attitude is just as important as your actions. You can do what your parents tell you to do, but you can do it with a bad attitude. And God says, no, that's not how I want you to do it. I want you to do it with a good attitude. And so one area that you can ask God for help, kids, is that when you ask your parents for something and they tell you no, then it's not easy, but you can ask God to help you to say Okay. You can say okay, and uh, you can have a respectful and a pleasing attitude to God. So Paul says that as you do this, this is a commandment that comes with a blessing. He's making reference to the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 20. And he says that you're going to experience God's blessing. You're going to experience a long and a good life. I remember when I was in ninth grade, I had a friend who was probably the most joyful, the sweetest, the happiest person I knew at that, at that time in my life. And she uh, came from, the, her family came from the south, like the southern states. And so she had been trained as a child to always refer to older people as sir and ma'am. And so she would say, yes, sir. Or she would say, yes, ma'am. And that was especially true for, for her family. So when the grandparents came into town, uh, it, it was very important that she remembered to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, when she was talking and listening to them. And I kind of got thinking about that. And this really rings true, uh, that a that child who is obedient and respectful to authority and is, is, um, has a cheerful attitude they tend to be cheerful people. Uh, when you have a problem with authority, you're fighting against authority, that's when there seems to be this, this inner struggle. And happy children are, tend to be children who are obedient. There's a direct correlation between happiness and obedience within, with, with kids. And that's what Paul says. You want to experience a, a, a long life, a good life, I believe a happy, a joyful life, then obey your parents. Then it gets to, then it gets to employees. Uh, he speaks about slavery, and slavery in the Roman Empire was a little different than the slavery we're familiar with here in this nation. It's all wrong, of course. I'm not trying to say there's anything good about it, but slavery in the Roman Empire, there are millions of slaves, and it, was not as, it wasn't a long-term, like, for the rest of your life kind of thing. And so it, it was more related to employee kind of a thing than uh, what we might be familiar with. Now, thankfully, because of the work of Christ through the church, the law of love, that love conquered the Roman Empire. And love and these beautiful gatherings of Christians in, the, in these local churches broke down all these barriers and these divisions that society had put up. And everyone in those gatherings knew that at the foot of the cross where Christ died once and for all for all, that we are all the same. And so in these, in these Christian communities, there was this breaking down of barriers. And so Paul uh, was trying to help 
with Christians living in society with these barriers and try to find that balance where when they're at church, they're equal, but when they're out in society, there are all these pressures. And so he started to give instructions about that. And what he said was that as, as an employee of someone who is an authority over you, God will reward you as you serve that authority with deep respect. And he uses that language, deep respect. He says, not only serve him with deep respect, but you need to serve your employer with enthusiasm. And he said that you serve them with enthusiasm, you serve them like you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and you seek to please them even when they're not looking. Now, if you are an employee that shows up, you're enthusiastic, you're always trying to think about what would benefit your employer and you're working hard, I don't think people are going to complain about that. And so employees are told that they will be rewarded by this. Christians should be the best employees at any kind of workplace, hands down. If this is their attitude, enthusiasm, deep respect, uh, seeking the benefit of those that they serve, then they should win the best employees of the month awards, like hands down, regularly, all the time. And children who are, are showing respect and are cheerful and quick to obey their parents, they should be the, the best kids on the block when it comes to this kind of stuff because we serve the, our ultimate authority, God. So that's the one side of it, how to, how to be a good follower, learning to be a good follower. Then there's the leader side of things. In verse 4, four Paul speaks to fathers or to parents, and he says that parents uh, need to be careful not to frustrate their kids. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. And parents can frustrate their kids to the place where they get so frustrated, they become angry. Some ways, that the number one way, I think, with, with fathers as, or, and men is with their, ang- with their temper and with their anger. And he says, that being harsh to a child is going to frustrate them. And so you need to keep your anger and your temper in check by the work of the Spirit. But they are told that they are to raise their children in the home of loving discipline and instruction in God's ways. And so it's assumed that parents, they're going to practice what they're teaching their kids. You know the old phrase, right? It's caught more than it's taught. Well, it works both ways, that it should be taught, but it will probably be caught as well as you model. You need to have this moral authority in your home so there's no gap between what you say you need to do or say not to do, but you're not, you're not doing what you, you're not practicing what you teach in that situation, and that will frustrate a kid as well. Um, Younger kids, they don't need to know why. If they're two, three, they just need to do it. They need to just get in the habit of obeying authority. But when kids get older and older, then they need to know why, why they're doing it. So that won't, because sometimes that can be frustrating as well. The Bible also says that parents are to discipline their children. Okay, this is where it could get a little bit uncomfortable, but it's what the Bible says. And people say, well, I hate to discipline, or I don't want to be mean to my, to my child. Well, here's something important about discipline. Discipline is not something you do to your child. Discipline is something you do for your child. Discipline's not what you do to them. This is something that you're doing for them. What I mean by that is that you're actually helping them to learn to be responsible and to be held accountable because when you become an adult, that's the way life works. In fact, Zig Ziglar says it this way, a child who has not been disciplined by love in their little world will be disciplined without love in the great big world. Translation, learn it now because it's going to be a brutal, rude awakening when they, are, they go from being a, a child and a student to an employee. And so if you are in a situation where uh, you are... Uh, finding yourself consistently nagging or yelling or bribing or threatening your kids, then this is an area you need to begin praying and asking God to help you to establish in a loving and and healthy way 
your authority. Someone has to be in charge. And God says it needs to be dad and mom. They're in charge. And so this is what God says. Proverbs 19, verse 18 says this, Discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. There's a lot of other Proverbs about disciplining and teaching children self-control. Kids need to learn how to control their, um, their thoughts and how to think properly about things. Children need to learn how to control their emotions, which starts with our thoughts. And when we think right, we end up feeling right, typically. And then children also need to control their behavior, learn self-control, for example. Okay, so in verse 9, Paul now speaks to the employers. He was speaking to the fathers and to the parents. Now he's speaking to the employers. And they said that uh, an employer, someone who's in charge, someone who's a manager, they need to respect their employees' dignity and treat them in a way that is just. They need to do what's right for their employee. In the early church, I told you that there's this amazing spirit of love and where these, these, these boundaries were broken down and, and there was this beautiful family um, atmosphere. I mean, it got to the place where slave owners were washing the feet of their slaves. So out in the world, you know, this is the boss, this is the employee, but in the church gathering, this was a part of the rituals back then in the early church, they would have a, a foot washing service and the slave owner would wash the feet of the slave. I mean, it's just a beautiful, powerful thing that God is doing. And so God, if he has given you authority, then you are to be God's agent of blessing in the lives of those who, who come to you. With uh, being a follower, whether it's being a leader, basically in this passage, he's teaching the same thing. You treat others with respect. You honor them as someone who is made in the image of God. You honor them if they're a fellow Christian. And God is pleased, he will create harmony, and he will create a great working environment. As I said, Christians should be employees of the month. I also think Christian owners, they should strive to make their, their place of business the best place in town to work, where people are dying to work there. And I believe that God can help you make a profit. I also believe that God can help you to bring profit to the lives of the people who work with you as well. So with, with the last question is, uh, what about bad authority, though? You know, I said, you know, there's human authority. It's, there's human authority, and there can be really bad authority. Well, we've got to remember that these Christians, they were living under bad authority. They were under the Roman Empire that basically crucified people that, that uh, didn't go with them. Well, when you're in a situation where there's bad authority, you have one of two choices, don't you? One is, all right, I'm called by God to, to stay in this situation and as much influence as I have to try to bring good and to shine light in this situation, or you will be called eventually to, to leave that environment. I mean, it's kind of hard to have one or the, or the other but where God has called you to stay, this is where God, being the ultimate authority over, uh, over, over the course of history, over the cosmos, is so important. Basically, when you're in a situation where you've got bad authority, you need to ask yourself this question. And that is, who is the ultimate authority here? Who is the ultimate authority? Is this person more powerful then God, can he really thwart what God is doing in, in this world, in the cosmos? Yes, even in this company or in this, or in this situation. Of course, the answer is no. God promises that he will reward and he will protect those who are good followers and those who are good leaders. Because you can also have bad followers and you have to work that as well. Now, it's a little easier with that because you can just fire them and get rid of them. But what if they're your brother-in-law or something like that? And then it gets really interesting, doesn't it? And so um, God honors that, though. And as you seek to honor God in your employment situation, as you seek to honor God in your home, God says he will, prop, he will protect you, he'll create harmony and blessing. Now, 
at this point in time, I'm going to invite us to come and take communion. And I want to tie together what, what Christ did and what we are talking about together. And I want to talk about how Christ is our good news. The Bible says in Philippians 2, you should have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, cling to his authority as God. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared as a human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death upon the cross. And God has elevated him to the place of highest honor and given him the name above all other names, that in the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow. What the Bible teaches us is that we celebrate a Lord who had no problem giving up his authority for the sake of others. He emptied himself of all of his divine authority and he became a human being so that ultimately he could die upon the cross for the sins of the world. And that includes your sins, it includes my sins. And so he gave up his authority, he became a slave, he died on the cross so that we can become children of God. James chapter, or John chapter 1, verse 12 says that to those who believe and to those who receive him, that receive Christ, he gives them the right to become children of God. Anybody who receives Christ into their life, the Bible says that if they do this in faith, by his grace, you will become a brand new person. And so we celebrate the fact that Christ has given us the privilege of being a child of God. And then we also celebrate that now that we are a beloved child of God, we now work for Christ. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being a good, good father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being a perfectly obedient son. Lord, we know that the word says that, that my father is at work in this world. And Lord Jesus, we work for you. Lord, we may see our human relationships or we may see um, our work relationships with one set of eyes. I pray that you'd open our eyes in light of this message today and see the bigger picture and the more glorious picture of what you are doing here on this earth. Lord, help us to represent your name well as parents, as children, as employers, as employees. And it's in your name that we pray.